Here, the real wage actually then begins to fall in the United States. And actually, if, to do it properly, it, it was up here, and so the fall was by eroding the union power. You know, we started out here and we ended up over here after all these different shifts and changes in the labor power market. This is where we started, this is where we end up. So the shift to the right in the supply of labor power overwhelmed the shift into the right for the, the demand for labor power. And the reasons there are interesting and fascinating, complex, and there will be entire courses. Number two is an increase in the, a shift in the supply of labor power to the right because of women entering the labor force. And in part, only in part, women increasingly enter the labor force because their spouses or partners' real wage has diminished. And hence, to maintain the family income, it requires another member of that family besides the male to sell, in this case, her labor power in the market to supplement that, that income so that they can afford um, the standard of living with, to which they have been accustomed for so many decades. Be that as it may, that shift in the supply puts downward pressure on the wage. Secondly, the supply increases because of immigration. So into the United States during this period of time comes waves of legal and illegal immigrants, which puts downward pressure also on, the, puts downward pressure on the price of labor market as they um, uh, come into the labor force taking a variety of different kinds of, of jobs. First low paying jobs, but then moving up the scale to more high paying jobs. Third, it's true that demand for labor power shifts to the right, as I explained before, but the shift is not as, as robust as one might expect because there's an increase in the composition of capital that we have discussed in the course. So the index of mechanization rises, and that's got something to do with the computer revolution. So you, you, the, the U.S. economy doesn't employ as many people as one might expect from a robust K star plus lambda because the composition of capital is changing. More and more of the capital, C plus V, is composed by the value of machines. So you have these dramatic effects in the U.S. economy, which is pushing down the real wage. Okay, so let me erase this and let me then go back to that real wage. Recall, the value of labor power for all the workers now is equal to the exchange value per unit use value times unit, remember the use value. And this component right here is what economists call the real wage. Well, I think the argument I gave you over this period of time is that the real wage is falling for American workers. So this is being pushed down. Now it is true at the same time, the unit value of wage goods is falling as well. So that's a strong argument for the value of labor power falling in the United States. Okay? I think what happened, this is my interpretation of what happened here. I think the real wage starts to fall for American workers, blue collar workers. Okay? And I think that American workers start to become, um, start to accept a new norm, a new standard, which is a lower real wage for themselves. So for the first time in, in uh, U.S. history, for a prolonged period of time, the real wage falls. And in connecting that to our Marxist argument, I think that fall on the real wage produces a, this is Marx now, produces a changed moral and historical uh, uh, standard in American society in which the workers come to accept a lower real wage. Now I understand their acceptance of this is overdetermined by a variety of different things, not the least of which is they're continually being told that they have to uh, uh, cut their wage to be more competitive, otherwise American jobs are going to move overseas. So the global economy acts as a powerful force um, pushing workers to accept a lower standard of living, number one. Number two, their unions have been eroded, so the, the unions are not uh, there in the workplace um, to, to uh, uh, bargain for higher real wages. Moreover, in, in many of these industries, the unions themselves are complexly uh, shaped by this message because of global competition 
um, they have to accept a lower real wage in order to save the jobs of the uh, workers. And of course, the federal government then, with this picked up by the media and, and professors of economics and so forth, give the message that American workers have to come to accept this lower real wage so that we can survive in a global economy. So, I mean, the, the, the politics change, the culture change, the economics change, and hence, I think what happens that this lower real wage becomes normalized, and then in Marxian language, the value of labor power falls, as, long, as well as the unit value of wage goods continue to fall because of a higher productivity of labor. Remember, we did that. The higher productivity is a lower unit value of wage goods. And a, a very important um, uh, factor shaping this one is cheap wage goods in China. That is, China becomes a major producer of cheap wage goods, which are produced there, exported to the United States, which enables the wage goods to fall, okay, which in that sense offsets a degree the necessity for the real wage to fall because workers can go to Walmart and purchase these cheaper wage goods. So if you put them together, we have the value of labor power falling in the United States, and bango, we have then <laughs> what I just said to you. We have the average cost being pushed down because of a rise in productivity in the denominator, rise in the composition of capital, blah, 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 a reduction in the value of labor power. The United States becomes a relatively cheap place to produce commodities around the world. Okay? And so it's a recovery in industry after, not in every industry, obviously, but it's a recovery in a number of industries in the U.S., and that diminishes our loss of surplus value to our foreign uh, competitors. Let me just then put all this, if I may, together in one kind of uh, summary super diagram, okay, from what we have said. And the following diagram um, has become uh, relatively well known because of a, a good comrade of mine and a friend for many, many years has gone across the United States and Europe as well, and he has presented this. This is uh, Richard Wolff. Uh, the diagram is as follows, okay? And this is a diagram that Rick and I produced um, in an article for this journal, Rethinking Marxism, some years ago, just a couple of years ago. I'm going to plot here two things, the real wage of American workers, so this is the United States, and the productivity of American workers in industry. So this is the real wage in industry the productivity in industry, in manufacturing, okay? And this is over time on the horizontal axis. So I'm going to start with roughly the 1880s in the United States, and all these numbers come from the U.S. Uh, the government. They're all published numbers. And I'm going to go right up to the present. The productivity of American workers has steadily increased. In fact, starting roughly 1981, it kind of increases even more. Okay? So there's been a sustained increase in the productivity of American workers. That's what capitalism can deliver. Okay? A rise in the composition of capital, uh, new managerial techniques, and so forth. Everything that Marx described that you have read in volume one is reproduced around the world, and in this example, reproduced in the United States, and the productivity of labor rises. That's a great gain from capitalism. It develops, in Marxian language, the forces of production. The result is we get more wealth in the numerator with the same or even less um, labor power, means of uh, 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 workers times the hours that they work. Now let me put here the real wage. Over our history, the real wage kind of looks like this. So over a long period of time, I haven't drawn this uh, properly because this is 100 years, but all, uh, in, it, over the entire 100 years of our great industrialization after the Civil War, it's not just the productivity rose, 
But the real wages ro of American workers rose as well over a 100-year span, a ra rather remarkable um, phenomenon. That rise in real wage financed a rising consumption for American workers. And in many ways, it became the envy of the world, attracting immigrants into the United States. Obviously, they didn't come only for, the, for, for a higher standard of living. They also came for the freedoms that American uh, capitalism promised individuals. But be that as it may, this rise in the real wage and the consumption that it enabled helped to support, helped to uh, make, I should even say, make stronger than support, helped to make the American dream. Okay, which is a rising consumption over a lot longer period of time. So in Marxian lingo, to go back, okay, we have the value of labor power equal to the exchange value per unit use value times the real wage. Well, the argument here is that this real wage is rising. Okay, that's the red line over this long period of time. The productivity of labor is rising, that's the black line, and that's pushing this down, okay? So remember now what we did in the beginning of the course. A rise in the productivity of labor means it takes fewer abstract labor hours to produce commodities, and so the unit value falls, and my guess is that the fall in the unit value was greater than the rise in the real wage, and hence the value of labor power fell over time, and that means that the surplus rose. So I think that part of the success story of American capitalism is a rising rate of exploitation. Okay? It's, it's the connection of this story I told you about productivity and real wage to the rate of exploitation that is Marx's message. Okay? That's precisely what is missing from the stories of American capitalism, which is what Economics 305 and Marxism adds. It's this connection here. So the, the re higher real wage and the fall in the V, and therefore the higher in the rate of exploitation, in, in, a, in a sense, if, if I can just summarize this, in a sense, there's no revolt in the United States. There's no widespread uh, revolt, in part because the higher real wage compensates for the higher rate of exploitation. So capitalism delivers a higher real wage and a higher consumption, which helps to offset the rise in the rate of exploitation, okay? along with uh, uh, a variety of other mechanisms which overdetermines the inability of socialism um, to, to mount any kind of sustained presence in the United States, not the least of which is the idea of American exceptionalism, which is the United States delivers not only a higher standard of living, but also all the freedoms associated with a free market uh, system. That too has an important role to play. 1981, things change. Okay? For the first time in US history, this real wage stops rising. It kind of looks something like this. It actually falls a bit, right up to the present. Okay? So we have something new after 1981, okay? and this is reflected in the solution to that crisis that I started this lecture with and talked about last time, which is because of changes in the labor market, because of this attack up upon unions, because of a changed kind of uh, a culture in the U.S. in which workers are willing to accept a lower real wage, this no longer rises. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have now, I'm going to rewrite it over here, the value of labor power. So this is before, this is 1880s. to 1981, roughly. This is 1981, you know, to 2000, let's say, eight. Now, the real wage is constrained, and it actually even falls just a little bit. 